Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the Curry School. I'm Bob Pianta, Dean of the Curry School, and I want to welcome you to this morning's uh, presentation um, that is part of the um, speaker, the Curry Lectureship Speaker Series uh, sponsored by uh, the Virginia Education Sciences Training Program uh, funded by the Department of Education, Institute of Education Sciences. Okay, now we got all that out of the way. Um, I am uh, delighted uh, to um, welcome uh, today Kevin Miller uh, as our speaker, uh, who will serve as the keynote for the sixth annual Curry Research Conference. Uh, the Curry Research Conference is a, um, a meeting uh, that is completely uh, founded, run, managed uh, by our students as an opportunity for students to exchange uh, their research ideas and the work that they're doing across uh, um, the various projects that they're engaged in. It's always a tremendous uh, opportunity for us as faculty to see the incredible breadth and depth of the work that our students are doing. Uh, and and uh, reminds me, uh, at least an annual reminder, uh, of how rich uh, the work is that's, uh, that's going on here among our students. And I want to thank all the students for their participation uh, in, that, uh, in the conference, uh, both as uh, presenters and as uh, managers and leaders of the meeting. It, uh, it is always uh, a tremendous learning opportunity for a student to take the risk to present their work uh, in front of their peers, and you all deserve credit uh, for doing that. And I just want to acknowledge uh, students that were part of the leadership team and the organization team, planning team for the CRC. Just raise your hands if you wouldn't mind. Do we have anybody at? None of them are here. They're probably all out working, doing, uh, doing work. OK, good. All right, well, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, OK, uh, let me introduce Kevin. Today, we're delighted to uh, welcome Kevin Miller, uh, professor of psychology and education studies at the University of Michigan. Uh, his research focuses on understanding the relation between student learning and classroom processes uh, and cross-cultural similarities and differences in academic learning and performance. Uh, he is a developmental and school psychologist by training. I feel like we were joined at the hip at some point um, uh, and works uh, to understand the interplay. Oh, wait a minute, I got. The and um, development, and I'm sorry, I'll start again. He's a developmental and school psychologist by training uh, and works to understand the interplay of developmental and education processes in the development of fundamental cognitive skills. Uh, Dr. Miller is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and received his PhD from uh, the University of Minnesota. Um, uh, we should also uh, uh, recognize uh, persistence is a quality of, uh, of Dr. Miller, where uh, last year, you will remember, the CRC was the blizzard uh, snow, snow, uh, snowmageddon day, and we weren't able to welcome Kevin, so it is a great uh, honor uh, and pleasure that you, uh, you uh, 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 stuck with us and, uh, and are here again uh, today. So thanks, Kevin, and uh, welcome. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's really great to be in Charlottesville, home of challenging weather and, and challenging students. I really enjoyed the meeting um, that I had with the Vestfels before this, and I hope that people will feel free to uh, ask questions, make comments, denounce me, whatever, as we go along. Um, I want to acknowledge there are many collaborators that I've worked on with various aspects of the work that I'm talking about, and most of the work that I'm going to talk about today has been funded by IES, for which I'm eternally grateful. I want to make some pretty general remarks about the relationship between psychology and education, and then also some ideas about how you go about improving children's education and what that means for how you go about doing educational research. And that will all be uh, as a foundation for the argument that we both need to and can understand the processes of teaching and learning that go on in classrooms as the basis for improving children's education. And I'll talk about two main examples of that, one involving uh, looking at what teachers see and how they manage their attention when they teach classes, and the other talking about using automated measures of classroom discourse to promote discussion in classes. And then some general points about next steps. So <clears throat> my career has involved uh, spending time both in schools of education, alternately, and in psych departments. 
And as a developmental psychologist interested in what goes on in schools, there's ample ground to be embarrassed in both settings. Uh, it was always embarrassing to me during the many years I spent at Illinois in the psych department that I would study children's mathematical development in China and the United States, but I really didn't know as much as I should have about this massive effort that society's put in to try to alter the course of that development. Now in Michigan, I actually have a joint appointment in both the education and psych departments, and I'm part of a program that tries to combine the two. And in some ways, I'm equally aghast at some of the, say, teacher education students I work with who really don't seem to have any knowledge of or interest in students and children and their development. Um, now, in terms of starting by criticizing developmental psychology, there's a view that became pretty prominent over the last, say, 30 years of what I would call the heroic child. And this book, in some ways, I'm picking on it more for the title than, than for the content, because it actually is a really, really good book. But the idea that children are the authors of their own development is a kind of common trope in developmental psychology. And it leads to a particular trap, right? Because you have all these really cute, brilliant kids, and then they go to school, and what happens to them, right? So obviously, school's ruining them, um, because then they come home, and they're dull, and they're boring, and they uh, don't do well in the PISA. Um, now, there's an older view, going back to Vygotsky, though, that argues that you really can't understand one of these things without understanding all of them. That there's, the development is really a web or a rope braided from interactions among learning, development, teaching, all those sorts of things. Now, psychologists have always been interested in, in children's learning, but often in ways that I think are are problematic. You know, so going back to uh, in some ways a classic learning research quite a long time ago by, by Herman Ebbinghaus involved taking a bunch of consonant vowel consonant combinations and then looking at, at what was involved with relearning them. And what's interesting about this to me is that it systematically takes away all of the things that really matter for learning. His point was, well, he didn't want to study things that he knew something about, so let's take meaning out of it. So we'll just take these random things that aren't words in any language and look at how you learn it. But of course, the whole point of learning is to draw connections between what you already know and what you're learning. And so in some ways, this approach, even though there um, are some fairly interesting findings that probably do generalize in some cases, nonetheless differs systematically from what we think of as learning. Another approach very close to my heart, um, my training as a school psychologist, goes back to Alfred Binet, who again is a really fascinating person. There's a great biography of him by Theda Wolf that I strongly recommend everyone read, or if you don't have time for that, there's a shorter uh, paper by Bob Siegler, and I think American psychologist, um, digesting some of these ideas. School psychology developed to meet the practical need of identifying students for special programs. Not so much in Binet's ideas, but in the way it was used later, though, there's a presumption that people have stable traits and that what we knew, need to do as educators is to measure them. So Lewis Terman, who created the Stanford Binet test, um, in the introduction has a nice quote that really expresses this view, view pretty well. Before an engineer constructs a railroad bridge or trestle, he studies the material to be used and learns by means of tests exactly the amount of strain per unit of size his materials will be able to withstand. He does not work empirically and count upon patching up the mistakes which may later appear under the stress of actual use. The educational engineer should emulate this example. Tests and forethought must take the place of failure and patchwork. Our efforts have been too long directed by trial and error. It's time to leave off guessing and to acquire a scientific knowledge of the material with which we have to deal. Um, but the idea that people are the way they are and our job as um, researchers involved in education is to identify those enduring characteristics is a strain that's deep in the way psychologists have thought about education and obviously not one I'm going to recommend to you. Now where more recently, 
we have been thinking about how to go about improving education. There's some approaches pretty prominent in the United States that I think are pretty problematic. That basically involve either, well, finding better people, you know, better students and better teachers and getting rid of the ones we have, or giving people incentives so that they'll work harder and finally figure out how to do things. And it's interesting to me that that isn't, as far as I can tell, how real world incentive happens, a real world improvement happens. That rather, trying to understand the processes involved in education um, is more consistent with how improvement has been made in other contexts. And then one last set of these contrasts, two approaches have become pretty prominent recently in talking about improvement. One, going back to work by Clayton Christensen, although also recently applied to education, uh, is, goes under the name of disruption. This is a fascinating book, by the way. If you haven't read it, it's really thought-provoking. Another one that's both thought-provoking and I would argue more useful is work by Atul Gawande um, talking about how improvement has occurred in quite a number of different, different fields. So what are the basic ideas? <clears throat> Clayton Christensen has argued that there are two kinds of innovations. There are sustaining innovations where people just get better at doing what they're doing, but he's more interested, and his acolytes in Silicon Valley are more interested in disruptive innovations. So people come out with some new approach, and the kinds of things he looked at had to do with sizes of disk drives and computers, where they went, they got smaller and smaller, and whenever they got smaller, it was the case that the new ones really weren't as good as the old ones. They were more expensive, they were slower, they didn't have as much capacity, and so the people who were making the, say, five and a quarter inch drives had no incentive to go to three and a half inch drives because the customers didn't want them. They had boxes that had five and a quarter inch holes in them, so there was really no point in using the smaller ones. But then what would happen is there would be new applications where they could use these, and then over time, the smaller ones took over and the people who made the bigger ones were out of business. In the case of education, for some reason, these ideas have been wedded to a sort of Howard Gardner kind of multiple intelligences approach. But the idea is that what the future will hold is schools where each child spends their time sitting in front of a computer that presents to them precisely the kind of educational intervention that they need and that this will then uh, get rid of schools of the sort that exist today. Um, there's an alternative model that I think is definitely more useful for educational research and also I suspect far more realistic for improvement of uh, human kinds of institutions. So Atul Gawande, as I mentioned, um, people like Mike Rother looked at Toyota and other Japanese companies that have this uh, approach they call Kaizen involving identifying what are the actual sources of problems that people have in whatever process you're looking at and how can you improve them. Um, it's a bad time to use this example, but probably the best example of this has to do with airline safety, where over the last few decades, flying airplanes has become incredibly safer compared to what it used to be going back to some pretty simple-minded sorts of things. So aviation, for example, is where checklists came from. And the reason checklists came from there, according to Gawande, is that when Boeing had their first multi-engine plane, they had their best test pilots lined up on their field in Washington, and they took off and promptly crashed because they forgot to turn a switch to, to connect the engines to another tank at some point. And so they realized, well, if these guys can't remember to do this important step, we need to come up with a way to make sure that, uh, that it always happens. And by focusing on that in fields like anesthesiology or a lot of medicine uh, and flying, processes that initially, that not that long ago, were really quite dangerous have become much more safe and effective and reliable. And one point I want to end up with here is that having a similar focus on the processes of teaching and learning in identifying where confusion and other obstacles occur is a really powerful way of improving educational outcomes. Um, skip over this and start, because I want to get into actually talking about the meat of this. 
The two examples have to do with looking at the cognitive work of teaching and talking about uh, trying to make visible something that's really uh, evanescent in classrooms, namely the kind of discussion that goes on. So let me begin with an example. Um, just guessing, I don't mean to profile you, but I assume that everybody here can read. And we know a lot about what reading entails. Uh, there have been a lot of eye tracking studies of reading. I've done a few of them. But I'm going to show you just about a minute's worth of a um, third grade teacher, I think, uh, reading something to his students. And um, I'll just show it to you and ask you what you notice. Take it from there, okay? It's short. Uh, all right, let's finish this up. Um, okay, I'm probably going to finish most of this page. Although she'd settled into a... Okay, now that worked before. All right, let's finish this up. Um, so this is about Rita Mae Jameson, the first African-American Okay, I'm probably going to finish most of this page. Although she'd settled into a career as a doctor, May wasn't finished traveling yet. She remembered the trip she'd taken during medical school. Okay, it's a rocket ship blasting off. It's visualization. I'll accept that. She remembered the trips she'd taken during medical school and she still wanted to help people in other parts of the world. May decided to join the Peace Corps, an organization of volunteers who work to improve conditions in developing nations. So she's still giving of herself. She's reaching out and helping others. May spent more than two years in West Africa. She was the Area Peace Corps Medical Officer for Sierra Leone and Liberia. She was in charge of the health care for all Peace Corps volunteers and U.S. Embassy employees for those two countries. It sounds like a lot of responsibility. It was an important, oh, look, <laughs> it was an important responsibility for someone who was only 26 years old. Whoa. I learned a lot from that experience, May said. I was one of the youngest doctors over there, and I had to learn to deal with how people reacted to my age while asserting myself as a physician. When her tour of duty in the Peace Corps was over, May returned to Los Angeles and resumed her medical practice. She also started taking advanced engineering classes. That is where we're going to stop for the day. So remember, 88 is where we're going to pick up tomorrow. Okay, so pretty kind of standard experience. Oh, I guess I didn't say he's wearing a mobile eye tracking device that, and the circle is showing where his right eye is looking. But let me ask you, what did you notice there? Anything interesting about that? Yeah, he's moving all the time. You know, it's really, it's a huge multitasking problem. He's walking around constantly, and he's reading, and he's figuring out what's going on with the students. Did you? So. Mm -hmm. Well, their eyes usually go together. It doesn't matter that it's just the right eye, but yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's doing a lot of monitoring of the students. Okay, fair enough. Anything else that people notice? Yeah, it's, um, there was one point, you know, there's several points where you kind of see wheels turning in his head. One thing I should have set up, before this he talked about strategies for comprehension, including visualization, and so there's a point where that girl was doodling a, a rocket ship and he, he made the decision that, you know, looked there on the board and said, okay, that, that's visualization, I'll accept it. There's another point where he talks about her being 26 years old and some kids exclaim, and I didn't ask him about this, but I assume he's thinking, you know, you're, you're 10 years old, 26 could be 200, you know, what's going on with that? But then decided that there's nothing useful to do with that and just went on from there. Um, but the, the general point I wanted to make with this is that reading isn't simple, but it's something that we know a lot about. It's well characterized in psychology. But look at how different this is from reading. I mean, what he typically does is, so, okay, I'll go through and read something. Um, and you see that part, but then when he's saying it, he's actually not reading it anymore. He's walking around looking at the classroom, and he gets in trouble at one point because he, he ends up ad-libbing something that's the next sentence because he, he didn't read on to that, you know, something I'm sure we've all done. Um, but that's not because he's a poor reader. 
but because he's doing all these other things at the same time. And as we'll see, the kind of underlying theme of, of the talk, talking about ways that we can make some of these complex and invisible processes visible and then learn from them. And so let me begin by talking about a couple of obstacles that stand in the way of this. The sort of two problems of perspective. Now in social psychology, one of the most well-known phenomena is something called the fundamental attribution error. Um, hopefully Jerry can correct me if I get any of this stuff wrong. But <clears throat> that, that we tend not to pay attention to social constraints. So one standard sort of experiment you could do is I could videotape somebody making a really abhorrent speech. So saying that we should kill all the little kittens in the world or something. And then I could ask you just how terrible do you think this person is? And I could either tell you or not tell you, well, he was in a class where you had to draw an assignment out of the hat, and the one he got was to make the kitten killing speech. Um, for Americans, it doesn't really matter that if you want to kill, if you give a speech about killing kittens, you're a evil person. Whether or not you were kind of coerced to do it or not doesn't seem to really matter. Of course, it does matter a lot. I mean, college students are really good at doing this kind of stuff. And in fact, if you did the experiment, some of them would give really convincing speeches about killing kittens, even if they love cats. Um, when someone finally got around to doing the research in East Asian societies like uh, China, Japan, and Korea, though, they found a different result, which is that there um, people would say, well, you're a student in a class. This is your assignment. You'll do the best job you can. Who knows what you really think? that we tend to focus on personality if I show video of a teacher to students or to other Americans that we tend to decide this is a good teacher or a bad teacher. Even worse, we do it really fast. A very scary study if you're a college instructor was one that the um, recently deceased Nina Ambadi and, and Rosenthal did. Where, so what they did is they videotaped the first day of college undergraduate classes at Harvard University and put together three 30-second silent video clips. And then they showed them to uh, college students and then had them write you know, how, for example, confident the instructor seemed. And then those correlations, which you'll notice are absurdly high, are correlations with course evaluations by different students who sat through the entire semester and unlike these people got to hear the instructor's voice um, and you know, filled out the form that you all fill out at the end of the semester. Now, so this is pretty scary, right? Because it suggests, oh actually three ten second clip. You know, it suggests that when you're teaching, 30 seconds into the class is all over for the semester, right? That 82% that of the course evaluations are determined by how confident you appear. And so you can just you know, phone it in for the rest of the time and all won't be well. Um, <clears throat> we actually don't know this from this. I'm not going to talk about the research we've been doing today, but we have been trying to look at this question um, experimentally. What you don't know, you know, so there are two good possible explanations for this conclusion. One is, you know, as maybe your mom told you, you don't get a second chance to form a first impression. And so you show up and you're really disorganized because maybe you trip on the way in the classroom and that's all over. You know, that, that's the straightforward interpretation of this. The other possibility, though, that relates to ideas that go by the name of things like Machiavellian intelligence may be that what we evolved to be as a species is good at sort of sussing out other people. So it may be that these observers are right, that somebody who shows up and they're a mess and they're disorganized, that reflects their attitude to the course or their competence or all these other things and maybe that actually is predictive. <clears throat> and, and so ultimately I would say, so what we've been doing now is making, uh, recording lectures where we have someone either make a really bad first impression or a really good first impression and then give either a really good lecture or a really bad lecture. Um, and what we're finding is the results a little bit mixed, that those first impressions do matter in terms of your judgment of the sort of person that the instructor is. Uh, but in terms of what you learn and your evaluation of the instruction that you receive, at least for these 
you know, University of Michigan undergraduates, that that's responsive to what you actually experience. You know, so it's not, it's not all over. Um, but nonetheless, it is the case that we tend to focus on these sorts of characteristics that we can make judgments about really quickly. And I do want to quickly describe a study that we did uh, looking at, <clears throat> kind of inspired by the thin slice research I just mentioned. So we had, we showed two videos to college students and then we paused periodically and had them rate different things. So we had them rate how accepting, attentive, so on the instructors were. Um, or we had them rate student understanding, students' interest, teachers' management, content of the lesson, those sorts of things. Now, the reason we came up with these things, these two sets of judgments, is in a previous study, we'd shown video to um, teachers and students in China and the United States and had them just describe what they saw. And the Americans tend to talk about these sorts of characteristics of the teacher, you know, more than the Chinese respondents did. And the Chinese respondents were more likely to talk about these sorts of things. And what we found, so we had a, a first grade lesson and a fourth grade lesson. Um, so looking at the correlation between your judgment at a particular time, so after 10 seconds, and your judgment after you watch the whole 20 minute um, video. And then the line shows whether something is significant or not. And so very quickly, people form judgments that are highly correlated with what they end up saying at the end of the entire time. So consistent with the thin slice work. And similarly for the fourth grade lesson. Uh, for, for these, um, sorry, these personality sorts of judgments. Is the teacher confident, accepting, and so on. On the other hand, for these judgments of the instruction, there's a different pattern. You can see that over time, judgments gets, get more stable, and it's really not until, in this case, you've watched it for 10 minutes, that uh, almost all the judgments are pretty well correlated with what you see after 20 minutes. And that was true, again, for both the first grade lesson and the fourth grade lesson. So the good news here is that if you tell people what to pay attention to, right, that they can pay attention to things like characteristics of the instruction that they're watching that require you to watch an extended period of what's going on to make a judgment about. Bad news, though, seems to be that as Americans, the task we assign ourselves is deciding what sort of person this teacher is. And I think for those of you who are involved in training prospective teachers, this is a huge problem because um, if you show video and all the students are doing is deciding this is a good teacher or not, A, they can do it really quickly, um, but B, it's probably not what they should be paying attention to. I'm not going to argue that being a confident, dominant person isn't a good thing to be if you're going to be a teacher, but I don't think we know how to make someone confident and dominant if they aren't that way to begin with. You know, these are things that are really hard to change about someone. On the other hand, paying attention to students' interest and those sorts of things are things you actually could learn, but if you don't pay attention to them, you're not going to see them and you're probably not going to learn from them. All right, the second aspect of matters of perspective, though, has to do with perspective in its most literal meaning. Now, almost all the classroom video that's around to be seen follows the rules that the Tim's video study used. And they didn't pioneer them, but they described them pretty well. So what they tried to do is to show what a good student would be looking at. So essentially the teacher. Now, does it matter? I'm going to argue that it does. Now, anybody who's had the experience of teaching knows that it looks really different. And that's a kind of jarring experience that a lot of people talk about. When you stand up in front of the classroom, you don't see the teacher anymore because you are that person. And what you see is very different, which at a minimum imposes an extra step in learning. So you saw this teacher doing this thing, but when you're trying to transfer, it doesn't look that way at all. So at a minimum, it's an extra step. But I think it's the even are more problems than this. Now, one of the reasons I think people don't complain 
is that the student perspective is a very familiar one. By whatever, you know, criterion for expertise you want to come up with, we have enough time sitting as students in classrooms to be experts at that. Um, and I think one of the problems that people face in learning to teach is the feeling that they are already kinds of experts because they have all this experience sitting as students. So focusing on the ways in which a different perspective matters can really help. Now, it's hard, it's hard to actually call this a study. Probably someone should do it, but um, Dick Nicer described a really interesting thought experiment once where that in the introduction to a, an edited book. A very simple task. Uh, was interested in the role of mental practice on dart throwing. So they had students at Cornell were assigned to one of, first of all, they got some baseline data on their ability to throw darts. And then, because they're psychologists, they did a two by two experiment where they had people either, um, so mentally practice for a certain amount of time throwing darts, imagining themselves throwing darts. And either they always hit the bullseye or they always were off a little bit was one condition. Or, and while they were doing the mental practice, they imagined watching themselves across the room throwing arts, or they imagined doing it from the subjective or point of view. And what they found is success or failure didn't matter, but perspective did. That people who spent time every day imagining themselves throwing darts from their own perspective actually got better, and ones who imagined watching themselves throwing darts didn't. And so I think there can be something special about this kind of first person perspective, which now we have the ability to capture and present. So let me show you next a short example from the teacher perspective and then from the student perspective. And the student perspective is the standard camera in the back of the classroom. It's not a particular student. But um, again, ask you how, how it feels or how it looks different from these two points of view. And hopefully it will play. All right, I have another way of showing this to you, and so I will now do that. Feel free to talk among yourselves for a minute. line where it says what is one-fourth of three-fifths if you haven't already done so write your answer what so oh, first of all I apologize for the sound and actually the quality of the video so now what we can produce now looks much much better than this but when we had funding to collect all these data the technology wasn't where it now it's fourth of three-fifths what's what fraction is shaded in? OK, 
Okay, Alexis, what did you get? 320. 320s? Who got 320s? Okay, who got something different? Jason, what'd you get, hon? You got what? Did you divide one, two, three, four, five? So you did five, and then you did one, two, three, four. Oh, you know what you did? You had one fourth or three fifths, so here's three fifths going this way. But this way, you should have only divided it into four parts, and you divided it into five. See how you did that? One, two, three. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Leave your book open, and I'm going to ask you a question, and I just want you to jot the answers to the question. Are you ready? Here's the question. If you have three sets of four coins, how many coins do you have? Write that down right now. If you have three sets of four coins, how many coins do you have? Jason, what'd you get? Deja, what'd you get? Dylan, what'd you get? I'm going to skip ahead and show the same thing from the standard perspective. What I want you to do now on number two on the line where it says what is one fourth of three fifths, if you haven't already done so, write your answer. One fourth of three fifths. What, what, what fraction is shaded in? Okay, Alexis, what did you get? 320s. 320s? Who got 320s? Okay, who got something different? Jason, what did you get, hon? Yeah. You got what? Four did you divide one, two, three, four, five? So you did five, and then you did one, two, three, four. Oh, you know what you did? You had one fourth of three fifths, so here's three fifths going this way. But this way, you should have only divided it into four parts, and you divided it into five. See how you did that? One, two, three. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Leave your book open, and I'm going to ask you a question, and I just want you to jot the answers to the question. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Here's the question. If you have... So that's probably enough for you to get a feeling for what the two perspectives are like. So let me ask you what, what you in terms of differences from these two points of view. Yeah, and I like the first view, but I think it was happening fast. I felt like there was a lot going on. Yeah. You know, watching these videos, I suddenly and immediately understood why the classes I teach are so much more interesting to me than they are to my students. <laughs> um, right? Because look at all the stuff that she's doing. It's really complicated. It's really, you know, frightening, engaging, all those sorts of things. But then you look at it from the back, you don't see any of that. Um, did, did you have some, someone here? Well, I oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's slightly unfair because it is literally stationary. You know, it's not an actual student's point of view. But, but to, I think you get a feeling for the differences between. Yes. Yes. Right. I mean, I think that it kind of sucks you into thinking about what the teacher is doing, the decisions she's making, why she's doing this instead of that. And I'd like to think that it may block some of the uh, fundamental attribution sorts of errors, things to do, if only because you never get to see the teacher. So you don't decide, oh, this is the cool teacher or this is the, you know, whatever. But it may be a kind of empathy machine that causes you to think about the things that are useful to think about in terms of actually doing this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, and of course this is what the students, the students don't see all the stuff that the teacher is doing that's really quite remarkable and complicated. Yes. Oh. 
she might, I mean actually, I mean it's a standard sort of everyday math kind of warm up sort of lesson. So I, I think it's actually, I, other people may be able to talk about that more than I can, but I think I would say it's probably within the normal range by quite a bit. Yes, Sarah, and then the first time I noticed she was, um, I thought, oh, she's tuning into this individual statement, but then get the answer right. And then the second time I noticed that the student also had the same Right. Well, it's a hard thing to manage. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, and also, so notice ways in which her experience systematically differs from the students. The students that she's in, looking at are really engaged. She doesn't see the ones that she's not looking at by definition. And here you see there are people over there playing with their hair and really aren't part of the lesson. But they also aren't part of her experience. So her sample of what's going on is biased in this particular way, as well as her experience is going to differ importantly from, from that of the students. Even worse than that, in some cases I think it can almost be a zero-sum situation where the cognitive work that the teacher's doing means that the students aren't doing that cognitive work. So her sense of how, how you know, demanding and engaging the lesson is, is exactly wrong because the more demanding it is for her, in some cases, the less demanding it is for students. All right. So let's talk maybe a little more systematically about what it is the teachers see. There's a standard perspective that, pro okay, that you're probably all familiar with, so I will go through quickly, going back to Lee Schulman, about the kinds of knowledge that teachers need to have. So obviously they need knowledge about the content that they're teaching um, and knowledge about sort of general issues related to pedago pedagogy, but he argued for the importance of this middle kind of knowledge that he called pedagogical content knowledge. The kinds of things you need to know about, for example, misconceptions uh, that are important for teaching but might not be important for just being another practitioner. So I'm going to focus on kind of pedagogical knowledge, namely attention to students and how it plays out in the classroom. Um, you know, there's this idea of eyes in the back of your head. One of the points that will come up repeatedly is that one of the things that particularly makes teaching difficult is the need to do a lot of different things at the same time. And one particular aspect that's been talked about in other domains is what's called situation awareness. Your ability to understand what's going on around you and what it's likely to mean. And the alternative, what, what novices tend to do is called cognitive tunneling where you pick something that you think might be important and pay, pay attention to that. Now, I mentioned this kind of false feeling of expertise that people have for all their experience as students, but there are a couple of ways in which I think the kind of looking that teachers do really qualifies as sort of an unnatural act. And here are two examples. One is, if you're looking for something, you usually look where you expect to find it. Hopefully no disagreement there. Um, now, if you're a teacher, though, and you ask a question, and you, you know, so Jerry always knows the answer, so I look at him, and I ignore the fact that, you know, Claire finally knows the answer to, the, to this question today, and I don't even see that because I look at the person who always knows the answer. Uh, or Bob is always acting up, so, you know, if there's any sort of disturbance, I look right at him and, and see that that happened. Um, you know, though that's human nature, but it's, it's a problem if you do it as a teacher. Secondly, so one in instruction, something I call the bad boyfriend model of teacher attention, um, which is nothing but sexist, but um, <laughs> so what do I mean by that? Uh, at, at Michigan, probably here, most of the people who become 
teachers are female and so this is something they can perhaps relate to. But the idea is that a good boyfriend is someone who only has eyes for you and isn't looking around at everyone else. And a bad boyfriend is someone who's doing the opposite of that. But in some important sense, a good teacher needs to be a bad boyfriend, right? She needs to be, even though she's interacting with this student, she needs to be monitoring and paying attention to everyone else. And that's something, as we've seen in the paper that some of you have read, doesn't come natural to a lot of people who are becoming teachers. It's, it's polite that if I'm talking to you, I should pay attention to you and give you my full attention. In a lot of contexts, that's what we're socialized to do and that's what a good, polite person does. But as a teacher, it's a little bit irresponsible because you also have responsibility for everyone else. So, um, <clears throat> As I mentioned, we, one of the ways that we looked at this is the ability of teachers to manage their, deten their attention among the different students. And one measure of this is the Gini coefficient um, that's used as a measure of inequality of distributions of anything. Um, and here we use it to look at teacher attention. And you can see that, uh, so this is plotting the Gini coefficients of pairs of teachers teaching the same students. So an experienced mentor teacher and the novice teachers in their last semester of full-time um, um, practice who are the, teaching the same students. Generally speaking, the novice teachers had, had more of a problem in terms of focusing on the entire class than the experienced teachers, but it's not by any means perfect. And it's not the kind of thing I think you get feedback on um, as a prospective teacher or as an, a teacher. But one of the things that we did is we asked our participants to go through and give us sort of play-by-play -play discussions of what they saw while they were teaching classrooms. And I want to show you two examples, one from a novice but very articulate teacher and then one from an experienced teacher. So this will play. Oh, it is. And again, I'm, a fo I'm focusing on a student again a lot when he's answering a question instead of maybe looking around the classroom um, to make sure there isn't any off-task behavior going on. View. This is from the eye tracking one, and that's maybe I should turn the lights down in the front. Go do that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and then I, I kind of noticed I, you know, I was talking for a long time. So I decided to have them pull out their slates and maybe get a little bit more involved in the lesson. And it's just like a good in-class assessment as well to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And it's interesting, during the lesson, I didn't even realize that one student got out of his seat because I was looking down at the overhead projector. I noticed that a little bit before, um, a little bit previous in the lesson as well. Another student got out of his seat, and I was looking down at the overhead projector, and I didn't even notice it. And that's and that's just pretty amazing to think of that I didn't even notice that someone got out of their seat because I was so focused on the overhead projector. Right now, I'm definitely, since they, I just finished um, asking the question, um, I'm definitely looking around the room a lot to see you know, how kids are progressing with their work. Um, and then I focused in on the student who I noticed uh, wasn't really paying attention that much to the lesson. Um, definitely focused in on him and, and, and saw you know, how, he's, how he's progressing with his work. And after working with that student, um, kind of went around to the different students. I went to another student who I know sometimes have, has problems with uh, math and made sure that he was doing all right with his slate. And again, I didn't even notice, since I was focusing on one student so much, I didn't even notice that some students were getting out of their seats a little bit. And it was definitely nice to see, because the one student who got out of her seat in the white shirt um, near the front of the room, it looked like she was helping another student out. So 
that's always good to see. But I didn't even, I didn't even realize that because, again, I was focusing on one student so much. And yeah. it's kind of interesting, again, that I'm, I'm, even with the slates, I'm still focusing on the right side of the room. Like, I'm, I'm not even really looking that much to the left side of the room. And then I just focused in on the student who, who had been answering a lot of questions for the whole lesson. Like, even before, I, before, even before ending the question, I, I was already focused in on her. You know, so again, these are very natural things to do, that ask a question to look at the person who's going, going to have the answer and to simplify this really daunting task by somehow focusing on a small subset of students. Now this is an experienced teacher. I want to say a little bit about his weird classroom setup because it's not that uncommon, but interesting. So as classrooms have whiteboards, or smart boards now, often what they'll do is they'll keep the whiteboard there because you can't write on the smart board. And so uh, in his classroom and a lot of others, they'll put the smart board on one side, um, they'll put the whiteboard on the other end, and then um, unfortunately I have to put the student somewhere. And so what they often do is they'll, put half the students on this side and half the students on that side. And so for the teacher, he can't look at all the students at the same time. Um, and so he talks about how he deals with that situation, which you might think is a little crazy. But. This is my third hour English class, English 9, ninth graders. I teach four sections of this class, and we're doing a lesson on grammar today. And. Um, when I previewed this video, I noticed more so than I noticed in during class than I've ever had before how much I change uh, views and how many different students I focus on throughout the lesson. I, uh, I didn't realize that I do that, but now I do. Uh, now I realize that, obviously, and uh, I believe my intention uh, is to see as many different students as possible to judge uh, their facial expressions about whether they're understanding what I'm saying, whether they're comprehending it. Um, and it's not enough to focus on one student to do that because one student may get it, but the student next door may not. And so I like to look around to as many different um, students as possible. And I don't think I always did that. I believe when I was <clears throat> younger, both as a student and a younger teacher, I believe I oftentimes would focus on a certain point in the room to relax my nerves or focus on one student who seemed to be giving me more feedback and I think now I uh, focus on many different students to judge their comprehension based on their facial expressions and their focus and where their where their eyes are and things like that so um, right now I'm uh, getting something ready on my computer so obviously I'm not looking around at the classroom trying to prepare something on the computer while students discuss things amongst themselves and with me. I also look frequently, I notice at the kids' desks, not just at their faces, but at their desks, um, <laughs> to see if they're on the right page in their packets, to see, make sure that they're working on things for my class, because students will oftentimes do homework for their next hour while I'm trying to teach, so they're not getting what I'm doing. Um, checking to make sure they're writing things down that are relevant that I'm suggesting they take notes on. I do switch sides of the class quite often. My class is structured where there are relatively equal numbers of students on either side. The reason for that is because there's a smart board in the back of the room and a uh, whiteboard in the front of the room and kids need to be able to see uh, to the left or to the right of them, um, depending on which which uh, display I'm using at that time. This hour will mostly be the smart board. I usually write the schedule for the day on the whiteboard in the front, and the actual lesson goes on the smart board in the back. I also look more frequently to the back of the classroom than to the front of the classroom. I look in the back rows more frequently because um, it's my belief probably that the kids in the front have uh, you know, more attention on what's going on in the class than the kids in the back. And so I try to compensate for that by focusing on the kids in the back of the classroom more frequently so that um, they can be drawn into the lesson as well. 
I'm looking right now to see whether they're looking at the board and studying the question that I gave them. Most of them looks like, look like they are. A few are not. You'll notice that I'll look at the boys in the, on the left side of the classroom with the white and brown hoodie sweatshirts on quite frequently. Um, those two students and the students around them uh, are a little bit more talkative than the rest and sometimes a little bit confrontational with their other classmates and with, with me and with each other. And so I do focus on them quite frequently to make sure that they are uh, on top of things. Uh, I also focus on the boy in the back row just now with the black hoodie over his head because he oftentimes dozes off. And so I'm checking him to make sure that uh, <coughs> that Darius is paying attention and uh, not sleeping in class. Here I'm using the smart board, obviously focusing on that to make sure I'm erasing the parts that I need to. Uh, here I'm posing a question to the class, why do we study parts of speech, and I'm looking around into their eyes to see if anybody seems like they've got those wheels turning in their head right then, and if they... So I'm going to skip ahead, just want to make sure we don't run out of time, but you can see it's a very different flavor here. He's someone who's quite thoughtful about how he's moving around the classroom, who he's paying attention to. I wanted to show you a section where I had to bring up a computer to show something, because one of the things that we do find is that kills everybody. You know, nobody when they're, just like me a few minutes ago, when you're trying to get the computer to work, nobody has any attention for anything else, including this guy. Um, but as an example, the general pattern that we find that's a little complicated, um, this is a pretty interesting result. I'm guessing people are familiar with the class uh, analysis, the uh, observational system here. The, inner, the relationship between that and teacher attention was really pretty interesting. And I think in some ways not surprising. For teachers who are low on giving a lot of feedback to their students, um, experience didn't matter. And they had pretty good Gini coefficients. Here it's good to be low in terms of distributing your attention among the students. The, stu the, teach the beginning teachers who gave a lot of feedback to their students, though, were really quite poor at deploying their attention among the class. And you know, Mark Twain talked about being on a steamboat that had to stop to blow the whistle. And it's kind of like that, that for the beginning teachers, they can pay attention to a particular student and give him the feedback that he needs, or they can manage the class, but they can't do both. And where experienced teachers differ is their ability to do both of those things. So it's not a new idea, I think. but. The attentional problems of teaching are largely because of the need to do all these things at the same time. And the question of whether some of these, whether we can assist people to learn some of these things outside of the context of teaching uh, is unfortunately more of an open question than I would like. Oh yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Someone has to. Um, the other issue I wanted to talk about though is trying to make visible something that's that's literally invisible, namely classroom talk. So from the one thing that struck me from an earlier study that we did, so we looked at the amount of student mathematics related talk in elementary school lessons in central Illinois and in Beijing, China. And we, we ranked them from the most to the least in both countries. The, otherwise, these don't correspond. But what's striking is non-overlapping distributions. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I don't know if you can read this. Um, so this is five minutes of student talk, leaving out what teachers said in two of these lessons. So in the US class, the student talk consisted of yes, once, three, one, three times, nine, three, three, nine times, um, and so on. The most complicated thing that was said was subtract $13.33 off the $40. In the class in Beijing, I think four divided by five is four fifths. Then if it's eight, eight divided by the result of the bracket should equal four fifths. It equals eight divided by 10, so on. Um, really qualitative difference in the kind of talk that's going on. And one of the things that we found in talking to teachers about this is that they don't have a good sense of how much student talking is going on in class. For, partly for reasons that we just talked about with the eye tracking. And so we did a project trying to do something about that. And now here are short 
discretion into whether or not noisy measures can be useful. So all these devices like the, you know, that one could wear on one's body give you some information about exercise and they all have problems. If you wear something on your wrist and, wrist and you go for a bike ride or do a push up or something, it's not going to register that. Um, yet to the extent that it puts your activity on some kind of scale and combines exercise with just ambient movement that can encourage people to get more exercise. And so <coughs> we used a device called the Lena. Uh, that's it over on the right that looks sort of like a pager that's designed to capture um, toddlers discussion or the language environment of children. And so we asked teachers to wear it um, if students are under about 9 or 10 years of age, it seems to work older than that because it's design, designed for children, it just thinks they're a bunch of adults talking. And so we gave them a combination of some online professional development in terms of teaching people how to uh, manage effective and productive discussions and wearing this device. Oh, so. Um, so teachers would wear this. They would, uh, every day they would connect it to a computer in their classroom. It would upload data to us and then we would give them a report. And in the initial study that we did, we had the teacher wear this Lena and not get any kind of feedback. And then we de developed um, statistical models to try to predict the amount of, of discussion that was going on in the classroom. And I'm going to skip over some of this, but basically it can do a pretty good job of this. <coughs> but then the question is, is this information that teachers can use to change the amount of discussion in their lessons? And so we use this to identify teacher lecturing, discussion, or group work, or individual seat work. Um, and then the question was, can we do this? Um, we cared about these three categories. Um, and what we did is we broke the audio that we had up into 30 second segments and we had observers calculate or decide whether it was teacher lecture or discussion um, or, or individual work. And so we had two human coders do this um, separately and then we trained it on one of the, the coders and then validated it against the other one. And what we found is, as people going back to Paul Mill have found, is that actually the system does as well as human coders do in terms of predicting what a human coder does. Because even though human coders can pay attention to all sorts of things that the device can't, human coders are not good at being consistent. I mean, we had really good coders, it's nothing against them, but human coders like clinical psychologists or people making clinical judgments just are not very optimal at applying any kind of rule consistently. And so the good news for us is that we were able to identify uh, discussion versus teacher lecturing as well as human coders can do. And the nice thing about this, besides it being a lot cheaper, is we can do it right away. So you can teach a lesson and we can give you feedback that night before you teach again the next day. And so teachers got daily feedback in the amount of discussion they had uh, in class that day. There were a total of about 25 training days. One thing that proved to be important is before we gave teachers their results, we asked them to predict what it was, which they found pretty engaging. It was good data for us, but also so early on, uh, they were way overestimating how much discussion occurred. Over time, they got to be a lot more accurate, but I think having making you make some kind of commitment about here's what I thought happened in this class today and then getting this feedback is pretty powerful. Um, the amount of discussion increased pretty substantially over time which was exciting for us. Uh, so teachers were able to use this data. Uh, it was significant on the group level. One of the things that we found was that students needed some training too. This was something one of our teachers figured out for us, but we did more systematically. That students are not used to listening to other students. That um, someone doing research in Japan has argued that American classes are structured like a maypole with the teacher in the center um, 
probably no one's ever seen a maypole, but they used to have these things, <laughs> I guess, that with ribbons and people would dance around. Uh, anyway, like, okay, here's a picture of one. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, everything's focused on the teacher. When other students are talking, you get a little vacation um, while you can think about what you, what, what you want because what they're saying doesn't matter. So training students, here's how to have a discussion and you're responsible for what other students are saying is pretty powerful. And one of the reasons it may be powerful, and some other work I don't have time to talk about, is that when the teacher explains something, students assume that it's correct, and hopefully it is. When a peer explains something, they don't know that, and that may actually be a good thing. Because if, if you're saying something and I'm not sure it's right, then hopefully what I'm doing is saying, well, does this fit in with what I already know? Can I come up with a counterexample? All those sorts of active learning things you should be doing all the time, but maybe you don't if you assume the teacher is correct and it feels like it makes sense and so you have a feeling of knowing and so you don't process it deeply. Um, so, where we are now with this project, we can provide feedback to teachers that's useful and usable by them and also timely. Obviously, is not as accurate as having a human, you know, as transcribing a lesson and giving them feedback based on that, but by the time that happens, if it, if it ever happens, it's a long time away from actually teaching this. Um, not all the teachers benefit from this, and of course we had people who volunteered to be in this project and, you know, were paid to do it and, and got professional development and so on. Um, this is something that we are trying to figure out. We also including students and giving them their own professional development I think is something that is pretty important. All right, now, so there will be a little bit of time for discussion. I wanted to add one more theoretical concept at the end. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead, famous mathematician, um, wrote a really interesting, you know, 1911 sort of statement that I think is quite useful in this context and useful in the context of the current ideas about, you know, mindfulness. They wrote, it's a perform profoundly erroneous truism repeated by all copybooks and by eminent people when they're making speeches, that's how people talk then, that we should cultivate the habit of thinking of what we're doing. The precise opposite is the case. Civilization advances by extending the number of op important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. Operations of thought are like cavalry charges in the battle. They're strictly limited in number, they require fresh horses, and must only be made at decisive moments. I think that's a good way of thinking about teachers' limited attention in class, and even a better way to think about students' limited attention in class. That trying to find ways of automatizing things that can be automatized, so this uh, scarce limited resource of time and attention can be used appropriately um, is really a key thing for us to understand if we want to understand how someone ever can become an effective teacher. Um, okay, the last points I wanted to make is that I think this is a really exciting moment in time. You know, I talked about some eye tracking research this year, so 2015, it's now possible for someone to spend, say, $100 and have in their pocket uh, an eye tracking device of the sort that a year or two ago cost about $30,000, and actually I do. You know, so you can get these little devices now that you could hook up to a computer and measure people's attention in ways that I think will be really useful and really interesting, uh, both in terms of research and in terms of instruction. And I think something similar will happen with the sorts of mobile systems relatively soon, and that will be very exciting when we start looking at how multiple people in an interaction are able to work together and manage their attention together. I think it's also a moment where you can say that the next step in educational research involves understanding and improving the process of teaching and learning that go on in the classroom. And I think you can also say what the step after that is, which is that what's missing in a lot of this work, including mine, is a better understanding of student thinking in the context of learning, which of course is what education is all about, but by focusing on teaching practices and teacher thinking, difficult as that is, it's still only a step in the direction 
of understanding the sense that students make of all this. I mean, one thing, one thing that I learned at Illinois when Judy and I would teach this huge course together was how confused a lot of even college students are about what they're supposed to be doing in class. And it makes a lot of sense. You know, I may be sitting next to the best student in the class and I can look over her shoulder and see what she writes down, but I don't have access to the kinds of connections that she's making or the sense she's making of this information that's in front of her. But I think we're getting close of ways of making that public, or visible at least, in a way that we can teach a student, well, here's what you should be doing in class. You shouldn't be trying to write everything down, but you should say, well, does this make sense? Or um, why is he talking about these two things together? Or what are the connections or so on? I mean, I suspect that seems obvious to nearly everyone in this room, but it's not obvious to a significant number of students who are still have enough other talents that they get to go to the University of Virginia or the University of Michigan. Um, but by focusing on these processes that are central to what education is, I think we both can understand them, but also we can improve them, which is very exciting to me. So let me stop there, and I hope there'll be some time for questions. Thank you. Is someone, yes, please. device to focus primarily on the right eye as opposed to like the left eye? Um, yes. I mean, for most people, if you wanted to pick one, that would be the one to pick. However, it's not important because the system we have now uses both eyes and it actually is very useful in a classroom context because, you know, of course your eyes converge and being able to use both eyes gives you a more accurate tracking in cases like a classroom where sometimes you're looking at something right here and sometimes you're looking at something over there. So it's, it's sort of a temporary situation. In fact, how the eyes move together when you're looking at things is pretty interesting and we could talk about it, but it's sort of way beyond this. That they don't, that often, um, often when you, your eyes jump, they don't end up in exactly the same place. So you have to do a little sort of micro saccade to repair that. But I, I should say, one of the things that struck me with the teacher work is that, you know, often teachers will be, say, working on the blackboard and then turning around to look at a student. But I've been impressed with how accurate they are in terms of looking right away to exactly the student who said something or was, um, you know, raised a question. But anyway, that just happened to be the way the equipment of that era worked. Now we've gotten beyond that, which is great. Yeah, there. Please. <coughs> when you think of automatizing teacher behaviors, w what kind of ways can you automatize those behaviors and what, what are you looking at actually well, doing there? I did say automatizing and perhaps I should have said channeling better. One of the things that we talked about before that strikes me about American versus Chinese classrooms is how cluttered American classrooms are. And indeed, in the work that we've done, one of the differences between novice and experienced teachers is they spend significant more time looking at things in the classroom that aren't, aren't students and aren't instructional materials. You know, so sometimes there might be, say, a piece of paper on the floor and the teacher's not going to stop and pick it up and throw it away. But on the other hand, you see every time he walks by, he looks at that. It distracts his attention. And I'm sure that's even more of an issue for students. Now, the Chinese classrooms that we work in do something interesting. Well, first of all, these are all seated so they can look at the front at the same time. But also all the you know, posters and pictures and propaganda stuff is up in the back of the classroom so that they can look at it during the breaks and they do have about a 10 minute break after every class. And so they can play with that stuff. But during class time, there are only limited things to pay attention to. And hopefully what the teacher wants them to pay attention to is the most interesting thing. Um, you know, people have known for a long time that experienced and effective teachers develop routines so they don't have to spend a lot of time making sure everybody has a pencil or hands in their homework or so on. And that's making sure that their limited attention can be devoted to things that actually matter instructionally. Oh, sorry. Do you have a really unique point to understand individual children's experience in the class? 
Um, I'm particularly interested in what about the shy children in the classroom? And do you have any insights into whether some kids just are not getting as much attention as other kids? And this data. That's a good question. Um, so one of the things that we could do, because we had different teachers teaching the same students, we could say, you know, is it the same kids that get attention from both the teachers, which mostly seems not to be the case. Um, in terms of who, who gets attention, I don't have a good handle on that. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I think my, my strong guess from what the beginning teachers say is that they have ideas about who's likely to cause trouble, who's likely to know the answer and so on, and that guides their attention in the way that you would expect it would unless you thought about it. Um, but it, yeah, it's a great question. And I think the, the most interesting question to me would be understanding that child's experience. You know, so maybe in fact, you know, there's this idea of legitimate peripheral participation. You know, you may be a shy child who doesn't say anything and never raises your hand, but you could tell what everyone said and how it connects and so on. Or you may be tuned out. And there's not an obvious way to know that unless you're a teacher who knows that student and, and what their makeup and experience are. So it seems like a lot of it is about the teacher's attention on resources. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering um, what you think about teachers. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I'm wondering what you think about the increasing diversity in classrooms, especially the linguistic diversity, and how that helps. Well, uh, so in some ways I think it doesn't complicate it as much as it should in the sense that you know, what we see a lot are teachers delivering lessons irrespective of what the students are understanding and not having a lot of good ways of learning what students are thinking. You know, so there aren't, in the math lessons that we tend to focus on, it's not students who are doing the work of figuring things out, but the teacher is. And so in some sense a lot of the diversity you're talking about is invisible to them because they're explaining it the way they're explaining it and they don't have a good sense of the sense that students are making of it. But it's a really important challenge. Um, but in some ways it's one that's often invisible. And so maybe the first step is, in, so as students are required to do more of the work of explaining things, then that problem will arise and, and only then can it be addressed. Um, we saw a math class, we saw a language arts class. Um, did you cover a range yeah, of content? Was, yeah, whoever was willing to do it basically. So it was um, elementary school up th through secondary school and a range of different um, topics. Uh, in some ways one of the most interesting studies we looked at was a science lab where it talked about something that's really difficult to manage where there actually was a big, you know, an incident of chemicals getting spilled and so on. But um, it's sort of amazing that teachers are able to, to manage this and attend to what students are looking at and thinking and so on. But well, so I had noticed in previous work the tendency of, the, of math teachers to do all the work of explaining in classes. And so I actually said, well, maybe that just reflects this idea that American teachers aren't that confident in mathematics. So if I explain something, it'll be correct. And if the students do, they might make mistakes and I might not even recognize them or be able to deal with them. The problem is more general than that. I mean, where, what really brought it home to me was looking at a, a sort of young, dynamic teacher in a suburban Detroit, very affluent school, teaching a class on creative writing who talked the entire time. I mean, it would ask these rhetorical questions and answer them. It was, in some ways, this very but clearly these are students who had things to say and they had no opportunity to do it at all. Um, yeah. How do you look at how data relates to outcomes, specifically developmental social, social emotional outcomes? And children, how the attention of right. the teacher uh, relates to child outcomes? No, we really haven't. And that's, that's some, a connection that obviously needs to be made. It's, obviously it's difficult for all the reasons it's difficult to connect what happens in this lesson, whatever it is, to what you learn. But, um, but no, we haven't. But I think 
to the extent that these are stable, which we don't really know in terms of this is a pattern of looking at students and interacting with them that's stable across time. I think maybe connecting it to these sorts of social outcomes might, might be more promising than trying to connect to cognitive outcomes. I mean, clearly that's what we care about, but it's so hard we haven't done it yet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, please. Mm -hmm. That's college students, yes. And I'm wondering if there is any work or any work on that mm -hmm. to make those things happen, or So first, I, I know there's been some work as part of the um, you know, Gates Project stuff looking at young students' evaluation of teaching. Um, I'm less worried about this than I was beginning because, I mean, my sense is that the judgments that we make are often right. It's not just we have this bias, um, but that people who show up in classroom a certain way, that's meaningful. And, um, you know, so, so that's good to know in a way. I also think that, that the issue, I believe the issue is a, that everybody can make any sort of judgment. Um, but often we don't tell people what we want them to pay attention to. I mean, Herb Marsh has done some really interesting work on course evaluation, which mostly are pretty useless to instructors. I mean, I always look at my course evaluations and feel good or mostly feel bad. But, um, <laughs> but, they, but it's hard to know that, okay, well, this is what I should do. Um, but he's shown that if you ask people, you can ask much more specific questions and then say, well, if your students say this about you, you might try doing that. And then people actually improve their performance. So because, in part because we think, well, you're a good teacher or you're a bad teacher, that's what we ask. And all that can do is make people feel good or bad, but it can't tell them, oh, here's, here's why they're saying this and here's what I can do something about. And interestingly to me, in some sense, we don't even realize that's a problem. We think it's fine to say, is this person a good teacher? That that seems like a reasonable question and we answer it um, rather than saying, what, what can they do to improve this course or help you learn better? In the study where we asked people to rate aspects of teaching that the Americans were less likely to spontaneously attend to, they did just fine and it showed a pattern that looked more like Chinese viewers where they're focusing on what's actually going on and not this kind of halo of what sort of person the teacher is. Thanks, All right, thank you. Thank you. I think you're signed up for the